And good evening, LBE listeners, wherever you are. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I know every time we bring it to you, we always come to you with this is a special broadcast. They all are very special, and this evening is no different. Sister Kara, how are you? I am doing well. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Good. Thank you. It's good to see you on the screen um, in the in the studio. Uh, tonight we're talking about growing up Flagstaff, the South Side, uh, which is a very uh, distinct and unique uh, area of our beloved city. And we're going to be talking about the making of the Rio de Flag uh, documentary. Um, and so for those of you who are not here in Flagstaff um, and not familiar um, with Flagstaff, with the flag or with the Rio de Flag uh, issue, this is why we do this broadcast to educate, to enlighten, and to inform. And we're very excited this evening to have two hip and fly brothers um, who were raised here in Flagstaff and will share with us, I guess, their, their perspective um, on what their experience was growing up uh, here. And then we're going to share a film about the Rio de Flag um, project uh, so that we can have a conversation tonight. Is that right, Sister Kara? That is right. Well, right on. I got it right. So <laughs> I'm going to pass the platform on to you and uh, we'll see you on the other side. All right. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce you all to the two speakers who will be joining us this evening. They are also uh, the people behind the film we'll be watching this evening about the Rio de Flag project. Uh, first, we have Lawrence McCollum, who is a freelance videographer and short filmmaker. His projects include work on the award-winning documentary, I Am Falente, some assistant camera work for Vice, and behind the scenes work for Warner Brothers Records and the Big Three Basketball. He is an only child, so can be pretty quiet. He is not shy, but quiet as he chooses to speak through his work. Also joining us this evening is DJ 001. Born and raised in the mountains of Flagstaff, Arizona, DJ 001 has had music flowing through his veins for over three decades. From rock and roll to hip hop and everything in between, DJ 001 is, as, is a master of his craft when it comes to music production and live performance. With a strong background in guitar, drums and vocals, top of the line equipment and real vinyl, and hundreds of shows under his belt throughout the United States paired with a stacked resume of artists he has worked with, he is truly a cut above the rest. Welcome to both of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Thank you both for joining us this evening. And we're going to go right into uh, a viewing of the film that you gentlemen uh, created on the Rio de Flag project. And then we're going to talk with you about the inspiration behind it and, uh, and what it means for this community. So let's watch. This is the Flagstaff Rio de Flag flood control project. And this is what this neighborhood is looking at. This has been going on for 20 years, 20 plus years, where the residents are like, we need to fix this, we need to fix this. But now there's this concerted effort. I'm really excited to have come on council in 2008 and I've been passionate about needing to address the flood control issue in the south side. You see a lot of the private land being developed and built on, and you see people starting to look at the community or look at the city and decide what needs to be revitalized, what needs to be built. Just so happens the South Side neighborhood that really was an afterthought now has some of the most valuable property in the city. Why don't people have more pride in their neighborhood? Why don't they have more pride in their houses? 
there's a disconnect with the fact that, one, this was a historically segregated neighborhood that was poor to begin with. So you can only live in this neighborhood if you're this color. And by the way, we're going to give you a plug plan on top of it. These houses have been artificially capped at a certain valuation. If you want to do an additions, add-on, remodel, and it's more than 50% of your dwelling, you have to raise it up and out of the floodplain. Most people don't have that kind of money. When you look around the neighborhood, some of the houses are built in the 20s and 30s. They look like they're falling down. Maybe they don't have value, but the property itself does. And how do you make sure that those people get their money's worth? When I look at the flood control issue in Blackstown, yes, it's an environmental issue. Yes, it is a safety issue when it comes to flooding. But it's a social justice issue. It's an economic justice issue. It goes back to who has full access to the American dream. And if the American dream is home ownership, and if that is the number one way people get out of poverty and move on to the middle class, then that was not an opportunity that everyone in this neighborhood had full access to because of the flood control issue that was created. And that's why it needs to be fixed. I think it's important to point out though that this is not just a south side issue. When you look at the floodplain maps, this issue actually starts way on the north side up in the Cheshire neighborhood and comes down through the center of town and ends up dumping into the south side. Should there be or when there is a hundred year flood, you're looking at a billion dollars worth of damage in the core of our city. There is one third of NAU, Northern Arizona University, that is in the floodplain and the majority of the south side neighborhood. You see Flagstaff becoming more and more landlocked because it's in the middle of the largest ponderosa pine forest in the world and Flagstaff is surrounded by state trust land as well as federal land. And now really the reason why we're so interested in it is because you have this desirable place all of a sudden to live right between the heart of downtown and Northern Arizona University and you have this 10 block radius, this neighborhood where any place else in the country, the homes in this neighborhood would be worth at least a half a million, if not more. But because we have this, this funky floodplain. And in the meanwhile, and I keep looking outside past, you know, past the camera and to the actual neighborhood, you gotta stop and think about the social justice impacts. There are millions of dollars that people have lost because they were told that they had to build their house in a certain place, because there was the acceptance or the allowance of turning this neighborhood, the majority of it, into a floodplain, and then basically walking away for generations. So then when you pass away, what do you leave your kids? What would have happened to the people who owned these houses had they been given the same opportunity as everybody else? What would have happened if this neighborhood, if over time, just like everyone else's neighborhood, the property values had have gone up? Especially in a city like Blackstaff, Arizona, where the cost of housing is almost 50% above the norm. Property is worth a lot here. So while other people who lived in other areas of the city, you know, their property values went up over time. And they were able to tap into the equity that they had in their houses. And they were able to send their kids to college. They were able to remodel and expand their home and welcome maybe grandkids back into it. Maybe buy that car, maybe go on that vacation, maybe pull some money out for, for some other reason. You have people that were restricted because their property values of their houses did not go up. And this has been over generations, at least three or four generations. And there's no way to recoup the lost financial gain that they would have had over the many, many decades and generations. I think that there is a social justice issue here because we're still questioning whether or not we should do this project.
Um, you still have some individuals who were running for office recently wondering about the validity of the project. You've had other people say, well, maybe it'll just naturally happen over time where people will come in and they'll rehab the neighborhood and they'll build up and out. So one of the things that we have seen happening in the neighborhood is because of the artificially depressed property valuations, you have people that are coming in and they're buying property at a low cost for pennies really on the dollar. And they are coming in, they're tearing out the old, they are building new, and they are making millions. Millions. And so I keep going back to the social justice issue, the social equity issue, the social economic issue. There's the hope that we can get this flood control project done and pull this neighborhood out of a floodplain. Also somehow stop the gentrification that's already started in the neighborhood and the pushing out of the people who quite frankly were at the heart of the foundation of this city. How do we make sure that they're allowed to remain and their descendants are allowed to remain and they get to be part of this beautiful thing that we call Black Staff. So that's obviously a, a very powerful film, giving us an introduction to um, and telling us the story of the Rio de Flag project. So first of all, thank you both for the work that you did in putting that film together and in, in telling this important story. Um, I want to start our conversation tonight by just talking a little bit about your individual stories and, and uh, what it was like for each of you growing up in Flagstaff. So just to start us off, if you can just tell us uh, what it was like for each of you growing up in Flagstaff, growing up as native sons of Flagstaff. Lawrence, we can start with you. Uh, growing up in Flagstaff, um, it was different. Uh, it was small, obviously. Um, weren't a whole lot of, a lot of black kids. Um, so it was, it was, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a small town and I know it's hard to explain. <laughs> Justin, you want to go ahead? Oh, my turn? Go for it. Oh, I see. Uh, dude, growing up in Flagstaff, yeah, like it was, for me, like I grew up on the east side. I grew up in Dunny Park and so like everything in my world was pretty, pretty rustic. You know, it was pretty. It was. Uh, I, I I would say there was more cowboys than there was anything else, and there wasn't a whole lot of culture uh, on my side of things. Um, I then I, I soon began to find out that uh, there was a bit more culture in like the heart of Flagstaff as I, as I got older. You know, uh, I'm sorry. I'm like experiencing some craziness right now. Uh, uh, but there was, there was a lot of culture that I had found out was in like the heart of Flagstaff. And that was sort of, um, as I got older in the nineties, two thousands, we started to really realize that it was like, um, sort of a melding pot, you know, cause all I really understood was the native American culture and the cowboy redneck culture that was sort of the East side. Um, so there wasn't a lot of diversity. There wasn't a lot of like ethnic um, influence or culture to a lot of what Flagstaff was on my side of things, on where I'm at. So, I mean, there wasn't, I, I still today, I'm 40 years old and I show up at things. I mean, I, I got to DJ the Juneteenth thing three times in a row. And I mean, every year I learned something new where I was like, how did I not know this? Oh yeah, well, I'm from a small little sector of the world called Flagstaff that doesn't we don't really, or we did, we're more and more with projects like this and things where we're starting to educate people, it's becoming really cool. But as a kid, there wasn't a whole lot of like, let me tell you about the cultures that are around us or the people that are here or the people that are coming here, anything like that. So it was kind of a, for lack of better words, it was just kind of an ignorant upbringing, you know, stuck in this little, small little vacuum of a place that was a mountain town that, that worked really hard at keeping it small. 
you know, didn't let big business in. We only saw big business in the last three mayorships ago. What was her name? Sarah Pressler. She like let the thing go through that it was like bring in Home Depot and shut out Hunt's True Value and like took away all of the local money, local businesses that were doing, you know, the 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 task of the big guys in other towns. So yeah, and you know, before the production or our our program started this evening, uh, we were talking about the fact that you grew up um, not in the the central part of. Flagstaff, but uh, as you got older, you made that conscious choice to move into, and now you are living in the South Side. What led to that choice for you, and what what drove you to that neighborhood in particular? I'm I'm a people person. I really, really, really like people. And living in Donny Park, you had to like if you didn't own an ATV or have a, a, a horse that you could like go visit people. Like it was acres away from each other, so it just sucked. Like walking outside and seeing nobody. So when I was old enough in my own life, I was like, I, I always knew that I was gonna live on this side of town just so I could fall out of my house and go skateboarding or or just walk and just run into people and, hey, buddy, how are you? you know, and so that, that was my purpose for being on the West Side, always. Yeah, I'm curious because uh, Lawrence, I know with some of your filmography work, you have a, a I don't know if you focus on skateboarding projects or if that's a, a, a focus of some of your work, but uh, DJ, you just mentioned uh, doing skateboarding as well. I'm wondering how much of that was part of either of your Flagstaff story or if it's just a, an area that you're drawn to or how that plays into your, your individual stories. Lawrence is the baddest skateboarder I've ever seen in my life. I'm not <laughs> kidding. Hey, we were in junior high and this guy came flying over me at the Fox Glen Park. No, not Fox Glen, the Bushmaster Park. I'm not kidding, dude. The baddest skateboarder I've ever seen in my life. I don't know, I've been skating for a long time. And so skating, watching skate videos years and years and years, hours and hours and hours of skate videos. And then finally I was like, I think I want to make my own. And so that's what kind of stemmed all of my video work was all from watching skateboarding videos. <laughs> so that's awesome. Uh, what were some of your favorite things about growing up in Flagstaff? I know Lauren, she said that it was it was different because of some of the the lack of cultural exposure. But um, what were things that I mean? What were significant things that that meant a lot to you as growing up as a native of, of Flagstaff? Um, being on campus <clears throat> was actually really good for me, I feel, growing up, just because I was around older older people pretty much my entire life. And so it it kind of shaped and molded me, and it's probably why I'm so quiet, just because I've, I've always been around adults, and so I just never talk. And so um, but being around adults, I, I feel, and being on campus, I kind of, I wouldn't say grew up faster, but I was just kind of more aware of what was going on. And um, having a mom that worked for the campus at the time, I was, all, I was always, you know, what, what's this about? What's that about? And she'd come home and tell me this and tell me that. And so I, I always felt like I was kind of ahead of the game in a way. And so, I don't know, just growing up, I guess just growing up on campus in a small town for me was good. Um, if that makes any sense at all. Absolutely. How about you, DJ? I'm sorry, I'm glitching really hard here. I didn't know if he was talking. Uh, uh, the best parts of Flagstaff for growing up, I didn't know anything about them I, I, until I was an adult. And I look back at it now, and the best parts were the summers that were really short, but they were beautiful. And the, the, the season changes that happen every single year. You know, I lived in Phoenix for 10 years when I first got out of high school, and it was it was nice because it was a concrete jungle again, all back to the skateboarding. Like I could just like skate anywhere, just go do something. And, and there was always some endless sidewalk to make things happen. But up here, the the seasons really were the best part of growing up, you know, skateboarding in the summertime and having just that isolated time. I only had a few weeks really that you could like get in some good skating or having a good time with your friends and just hanging out and not having to worry about anything. And so snowball fights in the winter. It was rad. It was. 
at the, I, was, at high I was a jerk, but whatever, you know. <laughs> Did you say ice snow, Lawrence? No, I said at high school. <laughs> yeah, dude. A lot of snowball fights in high school. <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, where you both draw your inspiration, and especially when it comes to telling Flagstaff stories and uh, painting the picture that you guys did in this documentary with uh, visual and auditory pictures of of this particular community. Where did you get the inspiration for the project? Where do you draw your inspiration for the uh, the other work that you do? Um, the inspiration from the project. I always just, I don't know, growing up, I guess in, in the South Side or in the South Side area, I had a bunch of friends who, who lived there. And, and so I'm, I'm fond of the area. And I always, it's not that I feel bad, but it's always just like, I feel like it needs to change. And I feel like something needs to happen. And and if I can use my craft or my tool or trade or whatever to put something out there that'll maybe persuade someone or get in the right eyes of someone and tell a story, then I'm, I'm all for it. And I, I just feel like the South Side just, it's one of those stories that needs to, someone needs to see it. And someone needs to say something and speak up and help out. And so that's that's kind of where I stand on, on a lot of my films and issues. <clears throat> All right. Inspiration for the musical side of it was I just watched, uh, I watched what Lawrence had sent me a couple times. I told him before, long before, I was like, oh man, I wanna, I wanna score something for you. Like you, you can use a lot of like the musical compositions and beats that I make, you know, for your mute, for, for skate videos and the things that you make. But I'd like to like make something to what you are making. Um, and so watching it a couple times through, I was, a, as a music nerd, you go, oh man, well like big strings like makes things kind of somber and makes people like really kind of focus in and pay attention to things. But you also need some sort of a like motivator tinker. And I, I listen to a lot of lo-fi beats and there's just like little things inside of it. They're like these, it, it probably would just be like the high part of the keyboard, you know, when you're up on the high register, ding, 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 in like weird repetitive forms. But I tried to mimic that a little bit and making it thought provoking not just big strings that make everybody care about something. So mm -hmm. my inspiration for this project was really just watching what they were doing because I I took a lesson on this. I, I, I watched this and I learned something, so. He's incredible though. I already knew that it was gonna be amazing. So it, I I just gave it to him and I, I was quiet and shut up and sat back and let him do let him do his work. Thank you, it, it was fun. I, I'm glad I got to. You know, there there really was a particular quality of the music throughout the film, and it's um, you mentioned the the difference between that inspiring type of music and and kind of a call to action. Um, when I was watching this film and listening to the music, I kept describing it as almost a, a little haunting. Um, you know, it's it's giving a definite sense to to the film overall. Um, so I wonder, just uh, you talked a little bit about the process of, of creating the music and watching the film and and getting that uh, across. But what were you hoping people would hear in the music and and walk away from with? Um, from watching it? Were you hoping that they would feel that, that haunting sense or was it a call to action or? Uh, I, I, I was definitely aiming for the big strings. Again, I, I wanted people to have a, 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 an emotional connection with it, whether it be sad or upset or, or called, you know, uh, feeling active in something. Uh, or even haunting. I, I I never once had thought up until this moment when you said kind of had this haunting feel. I was like, oh, I guess it does kind of have this like eerie feel to it. Uh, I was really I was aiming for just uh, I, I wanted people to have a heart tug to it, but I also wanted it to be thought provoking. Um, you know, because I mean, anybody can sit through a speech, but when it has a little bit of a 
a draw to it with music because music connects us all in this weird way. We all associate to it differently. We all hear things differently. So, you know, one drum rhythm reminds somebody of another thing and, and another person of another way. So we all have this weird connect to it. So I just needed, again, somber strings, which just makes everybody, everybody in the room, I don't care who you are. I don't care what kind of music you like. If, if somebody <laughs> plays a really cool cello part, real soft and somber, It'll set the whole world just to, at peace. So, yeah, I used that and a little bit of a higher end keyboard stuff and the thought provoking um, sort of a melody on that. It's just like musically known. Like uh, Chopin uses a lot of that stuff, and it's just it is musically known as like these sort of thought innovating or, or thought triggering things, you know, these patterns and rudiments that just kind of make your brain go bum, 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 bum. My sister used to study at NAU all the time with that stuff. Just weird little beats on it, so, yeah. Cool. Just why hip hop works, because they just use tight little things that are like wah, 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 put a huge drum underneath it. And now we're singing <laughs> things like, all oh, the girls in the room, do the, do the. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great. Uh, well, I can tell you the film definitely has impact. We're uh, I'm looking at the comments that are going on as we're having this conversation. And um, one of the comments was just from uh, Jenny Marie Duran. Uh, and she says, as a proud Southside girl, thank you for this. So it's, it's definitely something that people uh, want to see and needed to hear. Uh, there was the question of where they could watch the full length film. Uh, and we did share the link to the uh, YouTube video. So folks can uh, go on and rewatch it and share it out to folks uh, to keep engaging with the story and, and make sure they understand sort of the history of this project. Um, I want to talk about, um, I, I know, Lawrence, you said that you were uh, kind of asked to uh, participate in telling this story. Um, but obviously, it's it's a, the Rio de Flag project is something that, as the film points out, it's been going on for decades. Um, and I'm curious as to uh, the timing of this film coming out. Um, and just why for both of you, the telling of this story is so important. Like why, why do people need to understand some of these historical things that are going into this project and understand the, the broader implications of what this project means? Justin. <laughs> oh, that's the handoff, huh? Okay. <laughs> gotcha, man, gotcha. No, um, go ahead. I'll go. Um, well, the first video that I did was uh, was on was the South Side South Side Soul Stories. Or well, there's there's two that I did, but it was the South Side Real to Flag story, and that was just kind of an a, um, an overlay, I guess, of of the South Side and kind of what it was and what it's about. It was kind of a brief, short, short story. And so I decided to come back and do this because I came back and I, and I was shooting and I was like, well, maybe there's maybe something's changed. Maybe maybe the the community is <clears throat> is, is getting better. And I looked around and, and it's still the same. And it, it kind of blew me away that it really hadn't changed. My time stood still. And so and with I mean, with all the protesting going on and, all the, and I guess the activism, and whatnot, I just felt like it was time for me to come back and, and and tell the story and try and do it in a way that that was, that was powerful, but at the same time was was, was still kind of soft and, and wasn't 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 too hardcore. And so and and, and I'm used to Flagstaff. I mean, I was, I was born here. I'm not born here, but I was raised here. You know, and and so it there's there's a there's a I've got, I've got a got a heart for for the south side community and for flagstaff and so i try to use my stories to try and enlighten that's great yeah. i i just want to see flagstaff be awesome and i can't mm -hmm. believe that the 
there is this, it, watching the thing and then looking around. Yeah, there, this is a social justice issue. Like, come on, like, like for real, where there's not anybody from the only park that has an investment in any of this property over here. And why is that? Like, why has nobody come in and, and helped build any of this up? Oh, well, because you think or you were told that it was a, a floodplain area or that there could be destructive damage and like catastrophic damage to anything that'll be there. Like, why, why can't we help pull all of that up and out of this? You know, like, why are, why is the city of Flagstaff okay with just being like, yeah, and that's kind of like that area, you know, it is what it is. Like, yeah, it's wrong. Like, like this place is right. awesome. Like, let's be awesome all the way across the board. Like, this place is beautiful in all the places. Like, why would we not make everything beautiful and build smart and be, I don't know, like engineer things the way it's supposed to be so that ravines run where the ravines are supposed to run and there's emergency drainage for all of the things like like we're smart people like why have we not put things into all of this like so yeah it's frustrating for me at least <laughs> yeah well and the audience agrees with you guys there as well you know there was a, an early comment as the film was just starting i'm trying to find it now uh, from Janelle Rohde, who said, we gathered five bags of trash from the Rio last week on the South Side. I'm a proud resident of the South Side and would love to see further revitalization minus gentrification. And uh, yeah, just talking about the, the development of uh, all of Flagstaff um, and with this particular neighborhood, it it's seeming to be that strong connection between if we're going to fix it if we're going to fix these historical issues uh, with this neighborhood and this this particular place where people of color were sort of relegated that this is the only place that you're going to live um, and or one of the only places that you're going to live within the city and it happens to be in a floodplain where you can't access that that uh, equity and and the wealth in their homes um, to see that shift in, you know, the the development of it, but at the cost of gentrification and and the folks who have lived there for generations. Uh, one of the uh, commenters also mentioned that they had they have a multi generation Southside family. Um, to see those folks being pushed out with this sort of development is is definitely a really telling story. Um, and there are different moments throughout the film where I think you both capture that feeling. Um, with the music, again, it, it did have that thought provoking and, and haunting quality. Uh, there was also a moment, Lawrence, where um, Mayor Evans was talking about the, um, she was discussing gentrification and the development of wealth where people were coming in and able to buy property uh, cheap and then make millions of, uh, off of it. And while she's having that discussion, you were focused in on some of the buildings that were in uh, sort of dilapidated states. And I wonder how intentional was that for you in, in having that juxtaposition? I was intentional. Everything that I do is very, <laughs> there's, there's a reason for everything. But um, yeah, it's, huge buildings and coming in and making all kinds of money. And it's, it's just not, I just look at it and just like, this is just so not right. It's not right, it's not fair, it's unjust. And it just, it bugs you, you know? It, it, and if it doesn't, it should, you know? And so I, I, shot, I shot actually a lot of footage of those buildings I didn't use as much as should have, but I shot quite a bit and it just, it, it, there was just something about the gentrification and the and the coming in and just destroying and moving people out that it was just it, it, it got to me and so that I definitely had to make sure that people saw that there were huge buildings coming in and people are just banking on it and it's not right. I wonder for you, uh, DJ, and living in the community and and living in the South Side. Um, how you see that happening around you? Is it something that you're aware of that's that's happening on kind of a constant uh, basis or is it something that kind of falls through the yeah. cracks of, 
public awareness? How does that work for you? Uh, no, I mean, we, we definitely see the, ch the change, the shift in paradigm is it's, it's kind of unreal. And it, it, a lot of the people that I know that live in this area still uh, kind of are like, this feels like a little Portland, you know, it's becoming, um, and I mean, in my world, everybody's welcome. So I don't care what you are, how it goes, but there seems to be a larger homosexual community that's moving in. And uh, I, I know a couple houses that have been bought by people from the Bay Area that were kind of tired of what they're going through up in the Bay Area. And they've said Flagstaff is where they're coming. And one one couple, a, a gay male couple, was like, why did you guys choose Flagstaff? And they said, we just Googled good places. And this is one of the places that came up. So we traveled here, worked it out. You know, it took them a two year process to find a place where they wanted to live. And they ended up buying here and and probably got it like coral said for pennies on the dollar and for them and so i mean it's it's very i see it happening um and there's a piece of it that's sad because there's there's some places where i skate through or i walk through with my kids now and i'm like oh this is nothing like what it used to be like you kids are not gonna, are not going to grow up in the same town that i grew up in and there's no way um you know big huge almost skyscrapers compared to like the rescue mission downtown. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, this, this thing towers over what was the biggest building downtown. So uh, it's, it's sad for me really, because I wanted to raise my kids in the same small town uh, that I was raised in. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of cool to see structure go up. I'm an architect freak. So I like to see, big, huge things happen when NAU started like doing all the special stuff off the union and whatever. It was like, what is going on here? So uh, it's cool to see some of the bigger structures going up and like the newer designs that they're using for architecture and building or whatever, but it's really taking heart of what this place is out of it. So I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a give and a take, but we definitely see it. Every day, something's different, man. Every day, they're moving a guardrail to install some next piece to the road or whatever. And so, so yeah. It, you know, it's, it's really interesting how you describe both the changing that you're seeing happening. And at one point, uh, one or both of you made reference to when it comes to the South Side, uh, it being like time stood still. Uh, when it came to the the development or the ability of folks to um, to repair their homes or to develop uh, the community themselves, maybe I'm wondering how that parallel um, is reflected to to either of you. Is it um, is it strange to see you know the development happening all around Flagstaff, and yet you have this neighborhood that's kind of frozen in place? when it comes to some of that development or just how does that feel to, to each of you? Uh, it is strange. Every time I come back, it seems like there's something new in Flagstaff. There's some huge new apartment building or something. And so it's just, it's, it's changing quickly. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, in the South side it's, it's, it's stayed the same. And so, I mean, eventually I feel like those people that are coming in and, and, and buy and buy and buy and build and build and build and, and push people out. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it, everything is just changing. But since, well, since when I was a little kid, you know, growing up here, the South Side, everything around the South Side has changed, except for a few things here and there. And it's, it's strange, very strange. I agree, but it's it's just weird. It's, <laughs> it's just weird. I, it, it is, and there's a, there's pieces of it that I'm like, oh, cool, man, this will be nice or whatever. But it is strange how there is, an, and not strange. I mean, we're, this is what we're talking about. This is the topic. Like, it's 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 just how how are we leaving that whole area just <laughs> completely untouched? Like, oh, well, we'll work out or whatever. Like. No, you won't work it out. Like, let's get in there. Let's let's help those people build some stuff. Let's like readjust the equity for their property so that they can afford to do the upgrades for what they need and to engineer and build architecture up and out away from all of that, so that there is cool homes for the people that live there and for people that have multi generation families there. You know, like 
you got four, five, six generations of families that have lived in Flagstaff in that area. Like, let's help them make it dope. I mean, it's, it's that simple, man. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm curious because, uh, like, Lauren, you mentioned that you weren't born here, but you were raised here. Um, and I know that you've you've moved away, but you you often come back for projects like this. Um, and DJ 001, you mentioned having you know grown up outside of the Southside neighborhood and making that choice to to come into the like, kind of heart of the community. So, for both of you, I'm wondering what is the draw of of the South Side in community or uh, in particular, um, what is the thing that keeps bringing you back uh, to this particular neighborhood or, or uh, Lawrence, in your case, just back to Flagstaff? Um, just years and years of riding my bike and skateboarding through the South Side and staying out late and getting in trouble and. All the fun stuff of growing up, of being a youth, you know, growing up in a small, small town. And then, and so, so uh, there's like a piece of me that I spend so much time on the South Side, can't even hours, I, I, years, and years, just skating and playing. And all my friends live there. And so there's just like a piece of it that I, I feel it's, it's like it's in me. You know, it's, I feel like, you know, Piece of the South Side is always with me. Even though I live in LA now, I, I always come back and I always go to the South Side. I always want to know what's going on. Um, Coral's always, you know, telling me this is going on, this is going on, and so I'm just like, that's not right. This is kind of cool. That's not right, you know. And, and so it's just something that it, it's like a magnetic feel. It just uh, just keeps pulling me back. This is something that keeps pulling me back. And so every time I come back, I'm I'm always curious as to what's going on and if I can. Have time if I have time, and, and if I can, if I can shoot something and and try and put something out there in the world that someone can see, and hopefully some change can happen, then I'm all for it. And 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 I and I, I cameras pulled out, and, and I'm ready to go. And so it, it's and it's just that area. I don't really care too much about the rest, but Southside is just awesome. And it should stay awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing that keeps drawing me back to this area, I mean, a Flagstaff, because I was born on the other side of, I mean, I was born at Flagstaff Medical Center. So, I mean, I was like here, but then they took me to the east side and raised me in Doney Park. Uh, but there's, so, okay, I'll tell you guys the truth. On the corner of San Francisco and Franklin, that would be the, uh, the northeast corner. Um, I dug a 25 foot hole and I buried about 10 grand in gold. And I just keep them back and checking on that little lot because I know one day somebody's going to try to, I'm just kidding. There's no gold at that lot. Nobody can have it. No, I just lost the people, five of our audience is going to that lot to try and find that gold. <laughs> and everybody's like, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's it's. it's I was about people, to man. interrupt. I was about to end the broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's this right here. It's it's the people, man. This is what I'm talking about. Like this is, you know, I've had more great experiences with the people of the South Side Flagstaff than I've had of anybody else that I hang out with. All the church folk or everywhere that I go with all the things. Like I have more genuine experiences right here next to NAU and up into the downtown area with locals, with the people that live here. And so that's that's why I wanted to be here because I love yeah. this place. That's awesome. And you know, Lawrence, there is- Again, there's no gold. <laughs> we had the questions, somebody asked in the comments, what's up with that lot though? <laughs> what's that lot though? <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> It's like 25 yeah. feet deep. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, Lawrence, with the film, you know, right towards the end, there's a really beautiful image when when it's talking about the need to preserve this community because it's a place for for family and that sense of community. There's the image of a parent and child walking 
down one of those streets together. And again, it's just such a powerful, powerful image of the community. Um, and there's a segment of the film that talks about the story of the South Side as the story of Flagstaff. Um, so I'm wondering how you both see that in your own stories. Um, and, and do you see yourselves as stewards of that story, um, needing to preserve that, that historical view or, or just uh, to tell the story of the South Side in the work that you guys do locally? Hmm. Just didn't <laughs> um, well, I mean, yes, that... I'm, I'm interested in preserving. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, the, the last <laughs> image that, that I that I used with the, the the two people walking there holding hands, that was just that was actually going to go first. And then mm -hmm. I decided that it made more sense for it to go at the end and kind of tie it all together. So, I mean, that's, that was just kind of random, but um, I kind of lost track of the question. <laughs> Is that a, can I get a repeat on the question? Can I get a repeat? <laughs> the question Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it was just, uh, uh, how you see yourselves as as living out the story of of the South Side or of Flagstaff, and how you see yourself as kind of stewards of that story um, as it's developing. Yeah, man, I'm I, I'm thrilled that I get to be a part of it. You know, like if if the people that I've met are the ancestors of the people that have been the the building factor for this area then that's awesome and the fact that 50 years from right now somebody might be like dj 001 was a part of trying to help that that become something better like that's just fabulous like yeah i'm i'm thrilled that i get to be a part of this like a steward of it yeah man like and then i i, I firmly believe in god and i believe that god orchestrates the people that need to be in places for things uh to make the right things happen and i think that god has just ushered us into a place of well, me being like, you know, Justin, I need your help, you know? So, okay, well, whatever you need me to do, man, you created me to make music. So making music can help convey a message or bring together a project that needs to be done. Yeah, I'm stoked out of my mind to be a steward of that. I can't believe that I get to be a part of this. So thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. <laughs> Shoot. Thank you for making the beat, man. That's awesome. It wasn't very good. That's what I do. <laughs> uh, Lawrence, with you, of course, we have to mention, and it was just uh, mentioned in the comments, that for those who may not know, uh, your mom is uh, Miss Deborah Harris, who is the uh, president of the Southside Community Association. She is very much known as a community stewardess um, and, and as a guardian of the story of uh, the Southside community and um, and its preservation. So, how did you see that as you were growing up? Like, how did that um, impact the way that you saw that community? Um, um, well, I mean, I guess everyone knows my mom, and she's she's very. Uh, hard nose, I guess I kind of want to say, and so I, know, I I I feel that I come back and I and I do these projects and I work on and, and I work on these projects because I feel like uh, <laughs> she's a I don't know it's a, so much going on. She sit right there next to you. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's, um, it's definitely clear how, how I mean, she is a very uh, ardent supporter of that community and, and 
uh, not afraid, I'd, I'd say a bold spokesperson for that community in particular and the development of, of Flagstaff in a way that's equitable. Um, and I think there's so much power that we see in the films that you've done that focus on uh, the South Side story, the Rio de Flag, the uh, sharing of Juneteenth videos that highlight uh, the beauty of that community. Um, so it's it's definitely clear in some of the work that you do, a lot of the work that you do. Well, she, I, I'm just glad that I'm in a position to to where I can I can film a lot of these events and I can be a part of the community. And, and even though I, I don't live here now, I still come back and and you know she's telling me about this and telling me about that. And and so it's 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 a blessing to have her there, and to have her maybe you know kind of push me a little bit to to speak out and to and to and to use my 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 talent or my skill to to try to try and help and I mean one thing I've learned from my mom she's always trying to help always and so I guess she's rubbed off and so and I come back and I try to make films and I try to put them out there and try to create a little bit of change Absolutely. Uh, for both of you, reflecting on the process of making this film, what stood out to you in the process of capturing both the image and the sound uh, of the South Side and putting it to film and to music? Um, well, I mean, I, I started making the doc and First thing I was like, hey, music, music, what am I gonna do? And I was thinking maybe I'll just get a beat, maybe I'll just get a couple of instrumentals. And then, you know, I remember Justin was like, yo, you, if you ever do anything, you, you gotta, you've gotta let me you know, score something. And so I was like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, and, so, and, and, and he lives in the South Side and knows about it and he's a Flagstaff local. And so, you know, my mom's like, you, you, gotta, you, got, you gotta go, you gotta go with him, you know? And, and so, I mean, we made an amazing, amazing instrumental for it, scored. I couldn't be more happier with the job that he did. <laughs> I'm like, like I said, I, I just sent him, the, I sent him the video with minimum sound and he just created a masterpiece. And so it was, it was, it was I, I got lucky. As a, as a filmmaker, I got lucky. Uh, man, I got your back all the time. You just tell me what you want. No problem. Every time <laughs> you just send it over. But no, I was, yeah, yeah. I, I, the inspiration for any of it was that it just was, it, it was this very serious project. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we do that's not so serious. You know, Lawrence, he produced the documentary for my group and, and there's other things we put together. There's gay videos and stuff that, I mean, it's, it's big business for somebody who's doing it, but at the, at the core of all of it, it's, 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 I mean, it's not, anything huge or professional and there's not anything deep to it and you can make people feel a little bit with music on some stuff but at the end of the day it's just a guy landing a kick with whatever it's just some guys rapping so uh but, but this it had an essence of urgency and an essence of, of importance that really uh was it, it was kind of easy once i watched it a few times to be like okay this is guaranteed where i'm going with this like we're going with the somber uh, emotional strings that'll draw them in and some thought provoking high end, uh, real tight drums that almost feel jazz influenced or whatever. And that, that was probably uh, artistically the trickiest part was like, how am I going to make drums that don't feel, cause I'm a hip hop producer, like everything that I put out, I feel like just kind of has this like boom tick to it. So, um, I had to scale back a little bit and pull from some samples that were tighter jazz drums. Um, and put those in sort of sequences that wouldn't necessarily be a, a song. You know, I was trying to like stretch it out over like certain parts where Coral was talking and then make sure that we cut that out uh, when it was a, a different piece that, that moved us to the next thought or whatever. Um, so there was, there was some nerdery that happened inside of there, you know, trying to just get it to have the right feel and not just like a, a phoned in Oh man, here's a beat. Yep, just that's music. Yep, just filter for sure. Whatever the people's ears need to hear. So, <laughs> yeah. 
for, oh, go ahead, Ms. Bernadine. Well, no, go ahead. If you have a question, I can wait until after yours. Um, well, the question was just talking about, um, you know, there's a, a segment where uh, Mayor Evans is talking about um, the South Side having become almost an afterthought. Uh, and she she asked the question of, you know, where is pride in the neighborhood? Um, and what she's she's doing is juxtaposing that 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 question that often gets asked of well, why aren't people proud of this neighborhood uh, with the fact that it's a neighborhood that um, was segregated into poverty, um, segregated into devalued homes and, and all of those things. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure to emphasize, because it's so clear in talking to both of you, that you have pride in this community. And reading the comments from our audience, it's very clear that they have pride in this community. So how do you see that kind of juxtaposition working, uh, where folks from the outside are saying, oh, they're, they're just not proud of the community, they're not taking care of it, at the same time as you're living or having grown up within that neighborhood and seeing the clear pride that exists despite uh, those historical challenges that have been kind of forced upon that community. Wow. People, the people that say that they're, they're just not treating it right or they're not it like, that's, that, that's foolishness. Like this is uh, when the opportunity comes, this will be the, the living heart of all of this. And, uh, I mean, it's it, it's already started to happen. You know, this awareness that we're building right here with this with this little short uh, helps the the pride just increase that much more for the area that you live in. Um, so, uh, I if anybody's looking at it from the outside and saying, "Oh, well, they they just aren't taking care of it," like that that fools to me, man. Like this place is being taken care of, and it has so much heart and so much soul. It's beautiful. So. Uh, Let's just get everybody out of the floodplain. Just take some concrete barricades or whatever, whatever we gotta do. So we just gotta engineer it. But without the outside looking in that they people just don't know the history, I don't I feel about the South Side. And so it's easy to point fingers and it's easy to say, well, you guys don't care. The people over there have no pride and blah 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 when you don't know what's going on and you don't really care. So I mean that's that's kind of what I feel is it's like people don't know, don't show, or don't care about what's going on in the South Side. <laughs> you know, Sister Kara, I, I popped in because I, I'm watching this and I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, I'm a Lewis, and, and so I, I, I popped in because I want to stir up a little good trouble um, about the Rio de Flag and about the, the true meaning of why ethnic people would be placed um, in this particular area. Um, you know, everything we know in this system um, has been designed uh, with a master plan. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just, we need to put it out there for the record. And, and so I'm, I'm on here to ask my little brother, my little big brother, Lawrence, um, and I'm going to, to, to ask my favorite DJ uh, a question as well. But Brother Lawrence, we need to put it on the record. Uh, it, it's no mistake that ethnic people would end up uh, in a floodplain. And, and I really need you to speak to that this evening, please. Uh, well, they were placed there, obviously. It, to me, it just it feels like it was just an area that no one else wanted to live in. And so they're like, we'll just send all of them in that area and they can live there. And there's like, and there's, and then we'll, we'll route the flood or we'll route the river down through there because we don't care about them anyways. And 
so yeah, I mean, I feel like it, it, was, it was designed. There was a reason why they were put there. There was a reason why it was built through there. Um, Cause there were minority folks there and people didn't give it, people don't care. People didn't care. And, and this is why we have these conversations and bless you brother. Cause it was, it, it, it's emotional and it, it's real. It was a struggle for yeah. you to even to speak on that. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, and, 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 but this is why we're doing this, right. To, to put it out there. Um, yeah. You both of you have said it. A lot of people don't know, um, and so here we are gathered this evening in this space uh, to make people aware um, of the fact that this is definitely a social justice situation. And um, but yet, but yet. As always, when you find people of color placed in these spaces, because Flagstaff is not unique. We're not the, the only city that has a problem where, where people of color have been placed um, in un, undesirable spaces. But yet, it, it usually, every city that I've been to, <laughs> Uh, the ghetto, the the unsafe places are yet the most beautiful spaces because of the beautiful people, the souls that reside there. And, and so, you know, Southside is a space, a community of beautiful people. And so now to you, my favorite DJ, <laughs> You know, we're we're looking at you, and and you're the only one on the screen. You don't look like us, but but you feel like us, and your vibe is definitely us. And and I I think it's beautiful that you found. I mean, just share with us what and you can you kind of you've kind of touched on it. What happened to you? What happened to you when you left Dooney Park and and came to the South Side community? I mean, what what you know, you kind of touched on it and and I think it's beautiful and I'd like you to go back and expound on that. Well, I again, I was drawn to the west side of Flagstaff because I wanted to skateboard. So it was easy to just like be downtown or whatever. But I mean, I grew up with Lawrence. Um, so I'd run into him and be like, hey, what's up, man? Uh, my friend Elijah Smith, I grew up with him, you know? And I was really drawn in uh, church stuff at the beginning. I had to come help with musicals at Riverside, Church of God in Christ, and, you know, come down to um, <sighs> the little Baptist church down here. It's the name escapes me right now. but. There was just all these kind of music things that always drew me in. And I mean, I, I attend the Nazarene church over on the east side over in Fox Glen, have all my life. But every time it's been like gospel music or anything that's drawn me in as a musician or just as an attendant, it's always been at those two little buildings right here in the south side. So it was easy for me to be like, well, I've not met everybody through church and music and whatever. And uh, I mean, the love is just it's just different. So uh, coming from Dony Park, where everything was so spread out, and, and everybody is pretty segregated over there. I mean, everybody's pretty, this is my fence line, buddy, and, and you don't cross over into my thing, you know? And so it was, as growing up as a kid, I was kind of like, I don't, I don't want this for life, man. There's got to be something better as far as, like, people. Um, you know, and I, I don't value structure or or... Or, or items or possessions, you know, I value my relationships with people and, and the time I get to spend with people. And so it was way more fun coming into a potluck at Church of God in Christ down in the little basement area where there was chicken and all kinds of fruit and all every, everything that I would want to eat as opposed to the Nazarene church where I grew up where it was like questionable if this green bean casserole was even going to be good for you. So... Uh, <laughs> yeah. The people and the food drew me in, but I mean, it's, uh, there's no denying that the culture that comes from the people of color that surround me is infecting. You know, it, I, I want to be, I, I come from 
what is my culture? I couldn't tell you. I'm German, so I mean, I, I could I could tell you a little bit of that, and that kind of gets a little bleak in conversation. But there's something very uh, attractive about the people of color that are so rooted in the heritage and dance and music and art and everything that comes with that. Uh, and so I'm 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 just blessed that I get to be welcomed into hanging out and being a part of the neighborhood. And I wouldn't have it any other way, man. The food is great and the music is awesome. So. <laughs> well, there you have it, uh, Madam Facilitator. I've I've come. I've stirred up my trouble. We got it out there, uh, South Side. You know, as always, the ethnic people are placed in these spaces to not thrive, and yet we do. And then we have our brother DJ to come in, and he found his soul, and. Um, and, and there you have it. That that's all I needed to hear. And um, so I'm I'm out. Thank you. <laughs> well, and if I may, I want to actually kind of piggyback off of that question um, and the statement that you just made about you know valuing people and spending time with people over buildings. Uh, and part of what always strikes me with the Rio de Flag project is that it was a, a water channel that was deliberately channeled into this neighborhood um, and created this floodplain that then people of color were relegated into this area where they couldn't access the equity in their homes. They couldn't build generational wealth. Uh, because of these these hindrances, again, decades, um, where it's an opportunity for Flagstaff to kind of make uh, that situation at least partially right um, after all this time. And the things that you hear in terms of opposition to the project, particular to the South Side, are things like, um, you know, the water is so pretty when it flows and we don't want it underground. We want to be able to walk alongside the water. And uh, you have that juxtaposed with the folks that are also still able, as long as it's a floodplain, to come in and, and buy up property on the cheap and then turn it for major profits. I'm just wondering how both of you respond to that sort of conflict. Um, when it's this opportunity to right this historic wrong and, and help the people of this particular neighborhood to flourish uh, against all of the things that were set up against them to ensure that they all. How do you respond to folks that are, are valuing the ability to buy property cheap and the ability to essentially walk beside pretty water that's, that's keeping people out of the equity of their own homes? It always blows me away that <laughs> that people the people don't care about about neighborhoods like this and it, it blows me away that there's time after time city after city you just hear every neighborhood in these in these communities and and there's floodplains and there's this and there's that and no one seems to care and nothing seems to happen and the whole water walking along the water it's because they don't live in that area so that's that's just kind of how I see it, you know, like from the outside looking in, I guess it seems fine or you think that it seems fine or you want it to seem fine, but it's not. And so uh, and then the gentrification, I just feel like it's just people figuring out that there's cheap land and coming in and trying, trying to trying to make money off of it. And and it's at other people's expense. And so I, I don't know, I just, I've, I've always just felt that it was wrong and it, it's, it's unjust and it's just not right. And it, yeah. Yeah. I agree. And uh, the response that I have to people that are coming in buying things for really cheap and selling them for a ridiculous amount, um, I mean, it's just flat out unfair that we can't readjust the equity on that property for the people that own it, the families that have owned it for generations. And some of these families are becoming, I mean, down the line now, they're, they're hard for money as a family. So their option is to sell for pennies on the dollar 
to somebody who's going to flip it around and get the equity boost because they are realtors or they're a different ethnicity and they get a better deal. That's the wrong in this. Like, that's the part that, like, let's just readjust the equity for the people and families that own their properties and whatever so they can take loans out on stuff and make things better. Um, so it's, it's the gentrification. It's, it's not fair. It's not right, man. Like, let's, let's leave the people. It's not happening the same way in Sunnyside, but it is starting to happen that way. Mm-hmm. You know, there are, there are families that have been there for forever and yeah, their little Mexican homes are kind of run down or whatever, but that's the way that they've had them for four or five generations. Uh, but that property is starting to become valuable and it's not in a floodplain, you know, that's just the, the east side of like that, if you will. So, uh, in the same way that some of those Latino families are going to be getting these better deals on their equity for the property that they've owned. And when they sell it, it's going to be, I mean, it's, it's an investment for whoever's coming in with the big money anyways, but they should at least be able to sell it for what it would be worth and not have uh, John Smith coming in and buying it up and selling it for something way out of what would have been available to the family that owned before. So uh, I think the real call to action is let's just readjust the equity and the value of the properties that are there. Uh, maybe like, let's just pretend that it's not in a floodplain. Let's pay attention to the fact that it's in the happiness, most, most hot side of town. And I mean, if the people that live there want to sell, they could sell for a decent price and go use that money to better their lives and do what they need to do or reinvest it in the area that they're in. Um, but it just, it's, it's tragic and unfair that we don't see the same availability or assistance come all across the board. So. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us this evening and for creating this beautiful film uh, that tells this important story and is is giving folks an opportunity not only to learn a, a little bit more about the South Side community, but also learn about the importance of the Rail to Flag project to this particular community um, and, and the work that it's doing. I want to give you both uh, the opportunity as we close out to just share if there was one thing that you want people to walk away from the film with or one message that you hope that they would kind of walk away with what would that be for each of you um. <laughs> there's a lot I hope people are inspired. I, I hope people are inspired to just want to help or to be a piece of the solution to just making making it right or at least assisting to make things better for what's there. Um, yeah, I hope that people are inspired to to get out there and make change and to look a little bit more into the project and learn a little bit more about the history and. Uh, Get involved, make change for the better, not the worse. All right. And how can Flagstaff help? Hmm? Uh, just asking the question of how can Flagstaff help with this work that needs to happen? Speak up, speak out. Contact your congressmen, council people, mayors, all that, all the, all them folk. Email them, call them, text them, all of that. Out of the mouths of babes, so even the baby is telling us to get involved, to speak out, and um, I like that because there, there you have the future in DJ's arms, and so 
I don't, I don't believe in coincidences that this little one would, would end up at, as we begin to close the show, this is why we have to get involved and speak out and get on council, contact your council, become a part of council. Um, that's why, that little soul right there, that's why. That's right. <laughs> I apologize. I think my network might be having a little bit of, of trouble here, so I'm cutting out a little bit. But uh, DJ, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that as well in terms of how Flagstaff can help? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's getting involved with, with the locals um, in the community. And it's, um, I mean, contact, contact our mayor. Yeah. Um, I mean, we... I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not a professional on activism, but I would say raising awareness is just talking about it. Um, you know, uh, if, if you are a realtor and you know somebody who's trying to sell or trying to, to buy something, if, if you have any influence on any sort of rates or percentages or anything like that, just do it right. You know, if there's any, if there's anybody who's got a hand in something that you can assist with it, do it, help out, like, like do what's right. There's, there's a lot of people out there who have some power and instead of doing what's right, they just kind of sit and watch their wallet get fat or how it works. But I mean, everybody knows what feels good and everybody knows what's right. Do that. So. Yeah, and just to highlight this comment from our audience as we wrap up this evening, um, Janelle Rohde, we 100% agree with you, first of all, that that is an adorable baby. <laughs> but also in saying that change starts from within. Change starts small. Uh, it's so important generations uh, that are growing up in Flagstaff. And so as we uh, close out this evening, we thank folks who are uh, joining us and uh, who have participated, who have uh, talked along with us and uh, who are learning alongside us uh, in this work that we're doing. Uh, we invite you to rejoin us for an upcoming session on our archive. Black Voices with uh, Dr. Green. Uh, this presentation will talk about why it is important to preserve the stories of Black folk uh, in this country. And that presentation is coming up this Sunday, May 2nd at 2 p.m. Arizona Mountain Standard Time. The Live Black Experience is dedicated to fully engaging the community in all aspects of the Live Black Experience and facilitating community dialogues regarding it that lead to mutual understanding, respect, and reconciliation. Uh, this is an important part of the South Side story, so I am gonna read through the rest of this for you this time because we're focusing so heavily on the South Side this, this evening. Uh, the Live Black Experience project is housed in the historic Murdoch Community Center, which is located on the site of the old Dunbar Elementary School in the Southside community. Dunbar was desegregated almost two years prior to Brown versus the Board of Education, and the school system here was held up by the NAACP nationally as a model for education. We invite you to take a few minutes to complete the survey that's linked on the screen and that will be shared in the comments uh, for this presentation. Uh, and we remind you that by taking that time to complete the survey, you're helping us to continue to provide the community with relevant and timely programming. And finally, if you enjoy the programming brought to you by the Murdoch Community Center, we ask that you consider helping us to continue this work with a monetary donation. You can do so by going to the link on the screen or scanning the QR code. Uh, that link will also be shared into the comments uh, for the conversation that we're having this evening. And once again, as we wrap up, uh, this conversation. We want to say thank you to uh, DJ001. Thank you to Lawrence McCollum. 
thank you for the work that you've done to tell the story of the South Side and the Rio de Flag project and the work that you're doing beyond these projects to tell the stories of Flagstaff and the, the other places whose stories you're telling. Uh, it's such important work and we're so grateful to you both for your engagement. Uh, we want to say thank you again to the Flagstaff community and the broader community. Uh, we know that there are folks that are watching this all across the state of Arizona, outside of Arizona and states across this country, outside of this country and nations across the world. And we're grateful to you for engaging in this project, uh, for joining us, for learning with us, and for stepping up to do the work that's important uh, to carry us forward. With that, we say thank you, have a wonderful evening, and as always, be blessed.